is the head of my life. She has the signage, which means life in the essence. Has the climbing to all the ministers in the building, all of the deacons, officers, members, and friends, especially to the ladies out there. I'd like to thank you once again for the invitation and having come all the way to Nova Scotia to share with the Grumpy Word of God. Just remind you that I am not a minister. Not a preacher. And the fact that I'm a preacher's wife does not qualify me to stand behind this podium today. To someone that loves the Lord and I love his word. And I personally thank God for every opportunity that he's given me to share his word with others. I'm going to ask you to pray along with me today. I said, I don't know everything, but I do know I'm glad to share with you. And ask you to turn with me. I'm sure everybody's on today, right? You got your, you got your sword with you? And ask you to turn in your Bibles with me to the 12th chapter of Hebrew. And last night we talked about the object of our faith. And tonight we'd like to talk a little bit about the faith itself. It's Hebrew, strong, and love. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endure the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to use for a second today. Where is your faith in God? Where is your faith in God? Would you bow with your faith? Precious Lord, Father, we come now to you. We're just thanking and praising you for this. Another opportunity to share with your people that we're holding the bond with you. We thank you, Father God, that they have come to with a hunger to know more about you. Father God, we stand before you as an empty vessel before a full fountain. We pray, Father God, to fill us up with your Holy Spirit, that you use us to guide us and direct us through your scriptures. Father God, we cannot live holy apart from your word. We cannot be people of faith apart from your word. So we pray today for your guidance and for your direction. Let us understand, Father, minister to our many needs, or there's somebody here that's hurting. Somebody here that has some situation in their homes that need to be ministered to. And we come to ask you, Father God, to minister to us through your word. Yeah. Father, bless us, Lord, and I pray that you receive the glory into your sin. We ask it all in the name of Jesus and for your sin. Amen. Where is your faith in God? You know, as I looked over this passage of scripture, I was reminded of when I was a little girl. I came up in a home with five brothers, which meant there were a lot of scraps around our home. Because between my brothers and all their friends, they were always at it, always fighting or boxing with one another. But the funny thing about little boys is that they never do just go at it. They've got to do all the preliminaries. It's something like an Olympics exhibition. You know, first they'll challenge each other by name calling, but they've got to do the Olympic. Uh, Punch each other with the shoulders in a circle. <laughs> then, you know, they're really getting serious and they take a stick and draw a mark on, on the ground and say, I dare you to cross that line. And let me tell you that if you move from there to put that stick on the brother's shoulder and say, I dare you to knock that stick off my shoulder. And you know it was really getting serious when they double dog did it because the fight would be on them. But thank the God I remind you that the world is looking at us in the same way. Yes. They are double dog dealing us yes. to put our faith yes. where our mouth is. Yes. You know, we talk a good game. Yeah. We talk about the gold, the storm, and the rain. Yeah. We say, send me over, I'll go. Yeah. Right. But as soon as the slightest wind starts to blow, yeah. as soon as we're met with the simplest bit of opposition, yeah. then we start to fall about the wayside. Yeah. So I challenge you too today with that same question. Right. Where? Is your faith in God? 
Now during the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, athletic contests were popular both in Rome and in Greece. It was a patriotic thing to be a good athlete and to bring glory to your country. In order to qualify for a race, the athlete first had to prove his citizenship. Now just anybody couldn't run in the race. You had to be a citizen. The writer of Hebrews compares the life of the Christian to the experience of a footman. He declares that we must run with patience the race that is set before us. Now I want you to take note of the fact that it's God that has set the race before us. The changes that you're going through, the suffering that you're going through, all these conditions that we talked about our forefathers and in the case of the ladies I was doing that our foremothers went through, they went through with a purpose. They just happy, heaven, God has set this race before us. Yes. Now, those that are qualified to run this Christian race are those that have accepted the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, yes. the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as total and final payment for sin. It's at that point that they become a part of the Christian family. They become citizens of heaven and are automatically entered into the Christian race. So get on up off the sidelines and prepare yourself to run. But in order to run the race well, special preparation must be made. You can't just get up and run. If any of you ever practice for a marathon, you know it takes hard work. You can't sit around eating bonbons all day and think you're going to get up and run and win a race. You've got to prepare yourself. Now, a person that runs in the Olympics will tell you that their life has totally changed. And for a Christian, your life just ought to totally change. The things that you used to do, you ought to be able to say, I don't do those things anymore. Because I'm living for the Lord. Now, an Olympic trainer or runner is at the whim and call of his trainer. His time is not his own. He changes his attitude. He changes what he eats. He's careful of the company that he keeps. For he's keenly aware that everything about him will impact the outcome of the race. But he knows that his image, the way that others perceive him, is important because he represents not only himself, not only his family, but his home and his country. So let's take a look at the Christian runner. One who runs in the Olympic, with the spiritual Olympics of life, must totally change too. Amen. Things I used to do, as I said a minute ago, I don't do those things anymore. I used to enjoy going on the dance floor. But when I turn my life over to the Lord now, I'm rocking and rolling for Jesus. The Olympic runner must change his or her attitude. They must change what they eat. Yeah. And they certainly must be careful of the company that they keep. Yeah. But most importantly of all, they must render themselves totally to their trainer, who is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now just as a runner must give special attention to his physical condition, the child of God must also give special attention to his or her spiritual condition. He must first condition his mind. So as a man thinking. So is he. And you might say, well, what do you mean by that, Sister Twan? Well, 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 how many of you in here today like to watch the soap opera? Some of you like to watch daytime. Some of you watch nighttime. But daytime, nighttime, anytime, there are ways that must be laid aside if you want to run a successful Christian race. Ricky Lake, Maury Povich, Jerry Springer, all of them. Jesus. Now let's 
speak in this our minds, we must turn our attention to our bodies. And like I said earlier, you can't just jump up and run a race. You can't sit around being a couch potato and think you're going to jump up and, 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 and run the marathon. It just won't work. You've got to be physically fit. That means you must abstain from foods that aren't good for you. You've got to cut out the fat. You've got to cut out the sugar. You've got to reduce the salt from your diet. You must be eating healthy foods. The Olympic runner knows that what goes in determines what he gets out. And he eats at multiple times a day, never skipping a meal. Now, think about you on the spiritual side. Those of you that never pick up the word of God. Those of you that use the word of God as a dust collector. Some of you have so much dust on your, your Bible you can grow potatoes on there.
our spiritual exercise. It's the type of exercise that will condition you for this Christian race. If we look at James, the first chapter, the first verse, we find that James was writing to those Jews that had been dispersed. Run away from their own homelands. We can relate to that, can't we, as a people? Take it away from their homelands, not by choice, but dispersed away from their families, away from their homes, away from those that they loved and knew. They were dispersed and not by choice, forced into circumstances not of their own choosing. And James would have said to those people, stand complain. But he didn't. He could have said, wring your hands and cry about your situation. But he didn't. He could have said, shed crying and tears over your circumstances. But he didn't. Instead, this is what James had to say. He said, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into dying temptation. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith broke it patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and in time, wanting nothing. Now, if we can go back, back 75 years and talk to those ladies that started the ladies' auxiliary, they can tell you that they've been through trials and they've been through tribulations. But we thank God that they persevered. We thank God that they didn't stand on the sidelines. We thank God that they didn't stand around wringing their hands and shedding bright and tears, but they pressed their way so that you would be encouraged to endure and to press. James, James said that when you are encountered with various trials, now trials may come in different, different forms. We don't just have one type of trial. Trials come in various categories. You may be going through an emotional trial today. You might be going through a relationship trial today. You might be having problems in your home today. Trials on your job or even trials in the church. Financial trials and accidents and trials in your private life and trials in your public life and life-changing trials and public and known trials, physical trials, whatever your situation is. Sometimes your trial may be a result of somebody else's sin. Perhaps you're a woman whose husband has gone to prison. And you haven't done anything wrong. But yet you're suffering a loneliness. Trials brought on because of somebody else's sin. But remember that trials put our faith to the test. Yes. It sends us back to this. But what we must do is pray. And look to God, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Keep in mind that without trials, we cannot be spiritually mature. Trials are what make you a finished product. So don't resist it. Don't fight it. Just let it happen. Because we can learn from our forefathers and our foremothers and sing a song that through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. But it won't be easy. That man that's not your husband, you know, the one that you love so much. He may be hard to put down. Those drugs or that gay lifestyle or bad attitude that's destroying your testimony. They might be hard to lay aside, but you must. Paul said that you not only lay aside the sin, but you got to lay aside those weights that so easily beset you and slow you down from winning and running this Christian race. Building spiritual muscle takes consistent practice. So go to your training manual. You know what that is? The Word of God, the Bible, and begin to follow the instructions of your training, who is Jesus Christ. Oh, you want to hear some cracking and creaking at first? I did. When I went to the gym and started to work out, I thought I could just jump up there and do that thing, and I was cracking and creaking and moaning and moaning, and that's what you want to do with And you're going to get some spiritual pains yeah. at first. But before you know it, you begin to see and
and feel changes in your spiritual life. Changes that others will see too. Yes. And begin to imitate. Yes. Now the next thing that the spiritual brother has to do is take a look at his spiritual equipment. And on the spiritual side, we've got to look at Ephesians, the sixth chapter, that encourages us to put on the whole armor of God. We've got to be fully dressed if we want to run a successful Christian race. And you notice that the Olympic runner, he doesn't wear heavy clothes. He doesn't run wear run over shoes. But he wears loose garments. Something that's going to free him, him up and enable him to run swiftly his race. So, too, the spiritual runner. You want to wear this world as a loose garment. This world is not our home. We are simply passing through. Now, look at this. The most important of all the parts of the equipment that the Christian must wear is the word of God. Now the word that the word of God is expressed throughout that sixth chapter of Ephesians. But I love the passage that says for us to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now keep in mind that the Christian must have more than just a general understanding of the word. He can't have just a casual understanding of the word if he wants to be a successful woman. And when the scripture talks about the sword of the spirit being the word of God, that word is not the same word that we find in, in John, the first chapter, where it says, in the beginning was the woman. No, that word is translated from the Greek word rima, which means not just general scripture, but specific scripture that's used for specific situations. Let me give you an example. When Jesus encountered Satan in the wilderness, Satan challenged him. He said, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones, be made bread. But Jesus could have said in the beginning was the Word, but the Word had nothing to do with bread. Instead, Jesus responded, man may not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Satan challenged him with bread. He answered the challenge with bread. So us can't do that. We can pull one or two scriptures. We can say, Jesus wait. But you've got to have more than just a casual understanding of the word if you, if you want to be fully dressed and win successful ways. Now the Christian man must take careful care in choosing his garments. As I said before, he must wear the wrong as a loose garment, for we are in the world, but not of the world. He doesn't clothe himself in heavy clothes, but in light shorts and tank tops, so as not to encumber him. By training, he must begin with weights about his ankles. So when he begins, his body gets used to strain to reach his goal. But during the actual race, the weights come off, and he finds that he can run faster because he's been conditioned to run with the added load. Now all those trials, all those tribulations, all that suffering that you feel you might be going through, those may be weights, but in a minute the Lord is going to take those in record time. Yes. Since the Lord has lifted the burden of sin from us, and each day we must lay aside the weight, yes. the attitudes, the hang-ups, yes. the attitude of unforgiveness, yes. the bad habits, yes. the bad relationships, yes. and the sin which seeks to slow us down, and we must press toward that moment. Uh-huh. And the Hebrew writer tells us that we must run the race with patience. Now, throughout this epistle, the writer emphasized the importance of a future world. Now, we can look behind us and say, oh, our condition is so bad. And oh, they did us so wrong. And oh, just look at us. We just can't do anything because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. We can do that. But instead, we must get a forward look. As Jesus had a forward look. He didn't enjoy going to the cross. He didn't enjoy the suffering that he endured. But the scripture says that he despised the shame, but he looked forward to the joy that was set before him. Now the readers were prone to look back and want to go back, but he encouraged them to follow Christ's example and to look ahead by faith. For Christ's faith, not his divinity, enabled him to endure. He kept 
see all your faith on the joy that was set before you. All those Hebrew 